Uh, now we can move to the second session of this morning. I'd like to give the floor to Gizem Jambulat. Uh, we have already heard her voice. Thank you, Gizem, to be here. And she will continue to talk about the first output of the project indeed. Her speech is titled Digcomp Edu as a framework for teachers of the digital era. So Gizem, the floor is yours. And there are a couple of questions in the chat as well regarding your surname, because people are interested to read your, uh, your thesis work. <laughs> So yeah, and the floor you. is yours. I was so excited to see the interest. So my name is surname. I, my name is Gizal Jamblat. Sorry, my surname is Jamblat. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot find my uh, project yet because it hasn't been published. I defended my master thesis two days ago, and I haven't submitted to the uh, actually department yet. But after I submit my thesis, if you're interested in, I can maybe send you a PDF copy of it. But finally, maybe in the future, I can manage to publish it uh, to um, reach a broader audience. But thank you very much for uh, your interest in my. OK, so my title is Digicom Edu as a framework for teaching uh, in the digital era. Um, so I will try to focus in, uh, in this presentation both the uh, theoretical parts as well as some practical suggestions for teachers to actually make a better connection between what I actually will summarize in this uh, presentation and what happens in real life in real teaching context. Um, so I want to firstly start with my presentation saying that as educators, we are in need to keep up with the latest um, digital in constantly in flux, but what makes um, teachers' role important in the digital era is that as teachers, our role is to be actually role models for our students who are actually are born into the digital world, but that don't necessarily know how to use digital technologies responsibly, appropriately, and effectively for learning purposes. Our second um, goal as a, as an educator is to establish a connection between our technical knowledge and our uh, content and pedagogical knowledge. So it is not enough for teachers to actually understand how to use digital technologies, such as how to utilize some cert certain software, digital tools, websites. It is beyond this technical knowledge, but it is more related to how we can make use of these digital resources that are available to us in the 21st century uh, with appropriate uh, instructive and pedagogic uh, judgments as stated by Bedecker 2017 and uh, Krimzik 2021, sorry, 2011. So um, Digicom Edu framework, in other words, the European framework for the digital competence of educators consists of 22 educator specific digital camp competences that are categorized under six areas. So in this presentation, I will touch, try to touch upon all of these uh, competence areas very briefly, and I will try to give some examples that you can use in, the, in your classrooms. But before I do that, I want to say that this framework is based on expert consultations that aims to provide a general reference frame applicable to all educational contexts, starting from preschool to adult education, university setting, including vocational schools and learners with special needs. So I can say that this is a pretty much um, adaptable framework that can be used by all teachers, not necessarily English teachers, math teachers, or high school teachers that can be used by many educators uh, as long as they are adapted to their teaching context effectively. So you might ask this question. I also a slide in my master thesis presentation as well because one might ask, there are many different um, frameworks, models for technology integration. So what makes Digicom Edu useful for us? So why should we use this framework to assess teachers and pre-service teachers and other educators' digital competences? So first of all, I can say that what makes Digicom Edu um, a better option maybe than the other frameworks can be that it is a collaborative work of both experts and practitioners studying in the field of education. So it comes from a very scientific background and it's a synthesis of the literature review and 
previous frameworks, models, and instruments. So it's related to the previous models as well, but it's a broader uh, framework that includes uh, the significant parts of these frameworks. So another thing that makes Digicom Edu framework useful for us in teacher education and also in research setting is that the use of Digicom Edu actually provides us a common language, especially in the European context, that can be used by, um, educa by educators and other parties is like policymakers while developing new approaches or new uh, pedagogical techniques or new frameworks. So we can use the same language and everybody can understand actually what do we mean by digital competence because um, if you have a look at the literature review, you can say that there are many terms actually um, used to uh, define what digital competence is, whether we should use ICT competence, whether it is digital SC, media C. But Digicom Edu actually uh, gives you a, a, the same language, a common language for you to use for your um, teaching contacts as well as a research. Also, it's, it builds on the European Digital Competence Framework for citizens. In other words, it means it, it is um, Digicom. So what, what is um, different uh, in Digicom Edu is that while Digicom specifically uh, focuses on um, citizens digital competence, uh, it's about the technical general skills that every European citizen need to have in the 21st century. Uh, the main focus of Digicom Edu is teachers. So they make a difference between um, a regular citizens, additional competence and teachers, additional competence, because they, they state that teachers need to use digital competence, uh, sorry, digital technologies uh, in line with their content, technological and pedagogical knowledge, which is also in line with the well-known TPEG framework. But what, what makes uh, this framework different from the TPEG framework is that in the TPEG framework, there are some knowledge areas, but it is not specific how to make an uh, established connection between these areas. But in the Digicom Edu framework, teachers are provided with some um, competence areas and sub areas and some proficient statements that are generated for each competence area. Therefore, educators and teachers can actually understand how to make connection between these areas and what is expected from them as teachers, you know, if they want to um, develop their competence in these certain areas. Also, as uh, Sanam, uh, Professor Sanam and Professor Bayot also mentioned, uh, there is also an online check-in tool that is um, designed by the um, Digicom Edu framework. So teachers can use this online check-in tool to assess their digital competence, and they can find out their digital competence, which is in line with the CFR level, and they can understand at which level they are at the moment and what they can do to move towards the higher stages in this framework. But this framework can also be used by teacher educators or other policymakers who, uh, who would like to assess uh, teachers, in-service teachers, pre-service teachers, digital competence uh, during teacher education. So um, as you can see from this figure and also um, um, Sanam uh, Yildiz have mentioned before. So this Edu framework uh, consists of six main areas. But for example, in my research study, I did not focus on the areas of uh, one and six because these areas are the complementary areas that are not explicitly related to educators' core pedagogic competences. So they are also important, but they are not directly related to educators' pedagogic competences, which was the main focus of my study. So I will uh, touch upon these uh, points very briefly, but I, will, I want to say that these core areas are digital resources, teaching and learning, uh, assessments, and empowering learners. So this is the overview of the framework. As you can see, all the areas are actually uh, connected with each other, but each of these sub areas has some specific uh, features that makes them a, a separate area in this in this uh, framework. But we should see that it's a dynamic process that is uh, affected by each other. Okay, so I, I firstly want to start with the core areas of this comp edu because it is more important for teachers to know at this point, I believe. 
Um, so digital resources area, as you can see from, the, from here, consists of three sub areas, which is about selecting, creating, and modifying digital resources. Uh, the important part is here, considering the specific learning objectives, context, pedagogical approach and learner group. So as uh, Sananilis has mentioned, we shouldn't use digital technologies for the sake of using it, just, just using it, or because everybody else is using it and we feel this peer pressure maybe, or our students uh, expect us to use digital technologies in our lessons. Yes, these are also, also some valid motives to some extent, but if we cannot support these motives, with these uh, pedagogical um, aspects to teaching, uh, our, our use of digital technologies in education might not be as affected as it should be. Um, so another thing which is very important in this area is uh, um, explained in the third sub area here. So it's about uh, to effectively protect sensitive digital content. For example, what we mean by digital uh, sensitive digital content here is, for example, this might be grades, students' grades or exam results, or maybe some uh, sensitive information about students' um, background. So we need to protect these um, information, sensitive information, and we need to be very careful while sharing this information online with others by uh, taking, uh, paying attention to the uh, privacy settings. And another important thing which is mentioned in this area is to use digital resources. So yeah, we do not need to maybe reinvent the whole wheel again and again. There are many resources available on the internet, but it is important to know how to use open and open resources uh, while um, using, um, for example, developing materials or maybe designing presentations or uh, scientific publications. So we educators need to be aware of how to attribute um, digital resources appropriately and correctly. Okay, so I wanted to give you some um, Ex examples that you can relate to this discussion more. I don't want to sound so theoretical because I know that the audience, is, uh, in the audience, there are many teachers. For example, these are very well known uh, applications in the market. But what I observed in my master thesis is that when I asked students to justify their selection or creation or modification of their digital resources, they start with sentences like, I use it because it is so practical, it saves time, or it is so fun, engaging, it is motivating, so I can increase uh, learner's attention. Yes, these are all valid points. Those are also in, uh, underlined in this um, digital framework, but we should also be aware of the specific learning objectives and pedagogical approach that we adopt while designing these activities. As I said, otherwise, this might not be a good choice. For example, um, Flipgrid and Wookie um, can be used for education, but, what you, but when you want your students to uh, orally produce something and while talking about their, let's say, hometown or their favorite movie, you can ask them to use Flipgrid. But I noticed that there are some students who feel extremely shy to show their faces and they are not ready to speak up yet. So for example, for these students, depending on your, on your learners and your teaching contacts, you can use Wookie as the first step, then you can go uh, with the flip grip as the next step, next step maybe. Or Wookie can be used with, with younger students because it includes um, uh, making avatars speak, you know, because it is more uh, visually appealing and interesting for maybe younger students, but Flipgrid can be used in all grades uh, without any problem. When it comes to for the, 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 the difference between Padlet and uh, Google Documents is that, for example, both can be used for writing activities. But if you want your students to express their opinions about something, let's say it's, it's about their um, weekends, if you want to use a a platform as a bulletin board that students can publish their uh, work so that everybody can see and comment on, Padlet can be a better option. But your main objective is to allow students to work collaboratively in, instead of like publishing it somewhere 
you can use Google Documents because it directly involves collaborative learning that students can use very easily. So it's all about your learning objectives. Another example, for example, I have seen that also in my master thesis, this was such a popular tool, WordWall. Uh, so uh, for example, you, uh, teachers can use WordWall as a wrap up activity, maybe at the end of the, end of, at the, end of the uh, lesson to understand students overall understanding of the lesson. But if your main objective is not to understand the overall understanding, but a deeper understanding of what they have learned from your lesson, maybe um, sending a Google documents or Google, sorry, Google forms might be a better idea because you can add more open-ended questions. So what I'm trying to say with these examples is that in order to make these kind of decisions, as a teacher, you need to be aware of the affordances of tools, such as their weaknesses, their, um, their uh, strengths, and you can choose the best options that is in line with your pedagogical approach, learning context, learning group, etc. Unless you do this, your, inter uh, your um, inter integration uh, of technology into your lessons might not be as smooth and you might not uh, address the uh, learning objectives. So I want to continue with the next and the most uh, of the work as understand uh, teaching and learning. So teaching and learning is about using digital technologies to teach the subject matter uh, you specialize in. So as I said before, it, it is not proposed for a specific subject matter, but all teachers uh, can use it considering the content, uh, their content and pedagogical knowledge. So what is, what is important here is that, so as a teacher, you need to be aware of the, uh, aware of your context, your learning objectives, for example, you can choose whether to use technology or not. So this is the first thing that you need to pay attention to here. So you should always ask yourself this question, if it really makes a difference in language, teaching or other teaching. Sorry, my focus is language teaching, therefore from time to time I make references to language teaching. Uh, but yeah, if it doesn't make a difference in teaching and if it is better, if, it's, uh, if it is not really needed, then maybe you shouldn't use it. Or maybe you can find other alternatives to use, for example, blended learning, flipped learning. So it's all about thinking of what would be the best option to use and how it, 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 it can be used in your teaching context to make these educated um, um, decisions, actually. So when it comes to the second one, guidance is about using digital resources to enhance the interaction and communication with students uh, within and outside the learning session. So teachers are not limited to the classrooms anymore, so they can reach their students uh, even 24 hours so to support their learning process. Another important thing is actually to enhance uh, communication and collaboration among learners and once again uh, to facilitate self-regulated learning using digital technology. So I will be giving some examples so that you can really understand what I am talking about better. Uh, for example, I, 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 I will try to give very well-known and simple tools to make it easier to understand. So for example, Google Classroom is a very well-known and uh, popular tool that is used by teachers, but I think this can be categorized under the category of guidance because, for example, teachers can answer their students' uh, questions, uh, they can uh, help them uh, while they're submitting their homework, or maybe they can create a frequently asked questions sections on Google Classroom, or they can record some video tutorials beforehand and upload them on Google Classroom so that students can actually receive help from these resources even before um, co consulting their uh, teachers um, explicitly. But what I want to mention at this area is that as teachers, uh, you are yes expected to guide your students, but also uh, you are expected to do this um, by also allowing self-regulated learning. So um, monitoring their activity and performance from afar so that you can only intervene when it is really needed from the students so that they can actually uh, manage the, their own learning process as well. Uh, the, next, uh, the next thing is collaborative learning, the next area. As I mentioned, as Sanam uh, Yildiz has mentioned as well, uh, my are the 
the uh, most uh, useful examples of this area, actually. And I believe uh, MindMeister, again, is a very popular tool that can be used for collaborative learning uh, purposes in which students can use collaboratively to brainstorm and um, create a very cloud like this, um, working with their peers after they have read an article, maybe, or watch a documentary, movie, etc. Uh, there are also many other digital tools if you are interested in. I didn't put in this presentation, but Lucid Chart, Mur Mural, Poplet, uh, can be also other examples that, that can be used. So another thing is um, self-regulated learning, which is a sub-competence area. So self-regulated learning is especially important in 21st century, where teachers' role is more like a facilitator and core a co-learner instead of a sole um, source of knowledge. Um, therefore, for example, um, e-portfolios can be a good example for self-regulated learning. So students can actually um, record their process, progress, and performance through e-portfolios, and they then they can reflect on their performance um, uh, and thinking about their whole learning process uh, objectively. Uh, another thing that can be used for this purpose is actually student blogs. So student blogs are good for self-regulated learning because it requires some planning beforehand. So students plan how to write that blog or they need to um, create a content. So there's this performance part here. And also this blog is open to a wider audience. So their, their peers or other people can actually read their paper so it will be more authentic and also they can receive feedback on what they have published and they can actually modify what they have produced based on this um, feedback. And finally, this is maybe more especially relevant for language learners. They can record their uh, voice they, while they're speaking they, all this, or they can record themselves uh, 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 in a video or they can um, have some uh, images that they that can show their process over some time and using these digital evidence uh, they can actually can understand uh, their uh, shortcomings and uh, strengths and they can take necessary actions to overcome their um, uh, maybe strengths and sorry weaknesses. So the next area is assessment. Um, I think which has become even more important in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, because our students are uh, not always available to us. They don't turn on their cameras. And as Fl Flores Gargo 2020 mentioned in, his, uh, in, in their article, it, it, students are actually hiding behind their cameras sometimes. So uh, what we can use is to use digital technologies to actually understand if they are active in the classroom. So I think this might be one of the best things about using digital technologies uh, during this pandemic. But also, uh, digital tools can be used for summative and uh, formative assessments, or maybe some peer assessments as well. So what makes digital technologies really useful at this stage is that basically they give teachers digital evidence. What I mean digital evidence, this might be a audio recording, video recording, exam results, or quiz results that is generated digitally. So teachers can use this uh, digital evidence, they can generate it, then they can critically select it, and then they can analyze and interpret what this means for this particular student's performance, progress, or activity, let's say, throughout the semester. You know? Also, um, we can, uh, teachers can use digital technologies to provide targeted and timely feedback to learners, then again, based on digital evidence, because you have this digital evidence that you have analyzed beforehand. Now you can use this digital evidence to provide your learners uh, with feedback and also make this feedback understandable to your students your, and these, their parents and also maybe administrators at your school as well through maybe some charts, some um, maybe presentations that you can also generate um, using digital technologies. 
So I wanted to again give some practical examples of assessments. I always hear uh, some comments um, uh, like uh, about the facilities in state schools in Turkey. As far as I know, in state schools, uh, not all students have access to mobile phones or tablets or uh, computer labs. But most schools generally have a projector or a smart board because of the uh, Fatih project. So if you're teaching, for example, in such a context where your students do not have immediate access to digital resources equally, then maybe you can use clickers for this purpose because while using uh, clickers, you don't need to, your students to have their own digital devices. What is needed is uh, one cell phone that needs to be owned by the teacher and one projector or a smart board. So you can actually um, give them these papers, like it, it seems like QR codes, and they look at the screen and decide A, B, C, D, which answer is correct. And they just rotate their papers to show which answer they think is the correct one. And the teacher actually scans the whole classroom to see how many students actually answer this uh, question uh, correctly or incorrectly. So this might be a, a alternative uh, for uh, for teaching context where there is no such uh, opportunities when it comes to uh, accessibility of digital um, devices. So ePortfolio again is a great uh, tool for especially for, for uh, formative assessment. I don't want to uh, talk about this again. And I know that Nearpod is also a very very well known tool, but I wanted to emphasize this here again because in my uh, master's thesis. Uh, students were so thankful for Nearpod because they said that uh, in their, for example, some of their schools did not allow students to turn on their microphones or cameras. I don't know if because of the policies and they are, I think they are sense of their uh, explanation. So they said they didn't know if they were actually there, they were listening to them. So while using these activities of new pods, such as quizzes, collaborate board and poll, students actually could see who are actually there listening to them because you can see the numbers of the students and their names and you can see their activity uh, throughout the whole presentation. And it also gives you uh, some scores who answered the questions and who didn't, etc. So another alternative to this might be a uh, talkative. Uh, this doesn't have to be a whole lesson like a Nearpod because you use a Nearpod as a platform instead of, for example, using a um, PowerPoint presentation. But if you don't want to use this presentation as a whole, but you still you want to ask your students some multiple choice questions or true false questions, or maybe exit ticket questions, you can use Socrative uh, and students can actually use their even cell phones to answer these questions, which is uh, quite actually practical in that sense. I also heard a lot from my participants in my study, they said, um, so yes, these kind of tools like Word, WordWall or Nearpod or maybe other quiz tools provide learners with immediate feedback. But I want to do something else. So I want to use, for example, a digital tool, but uh, based on this um, digital, that digital evidence that I will uh, actually gather from the source, but I want to, let's say, leave an oral comment or a video comment or comment, is it possible, they ask. So I think voice thread might be the uh, one of the best tools for this purpose. So you can actually have your students uh, design a visual presentations like this. For example, this presentation was on a Spanish cuisine and students can talk about this. And then as a teacher, you can use this section here to leave an oral comment or a video comment or a text comment which is even greater with this tool is that uh, even your students, when you allow them to see this presentation, can actually see their peers work and they can use the same toolbox here to uh, leave a oral or a video or a written comment to their uh, students so that they can also uh, build knowledge uh, collaboratively. So this is another alternative. And this is one final example from feedback is actually H5P. So again, uh, one of my participants' concern was to provide personalized feedback because when you uh, use um, regular quiz um, applications, you see color-coded uh, automated 
feedback, like if it is correct, really green, if it is, it is generally red, right? Or sometimes they receive a notification or a response, automated response saying it is correct or incorrect. But they said, I want to give them a feedback based on their performance, let's say, throughout this quiz. So I think H5P is a good example for this because in H5P you can use um, the score range. Let's say if your students scored between um, this range, you can uh, write a specific feedback. If they um, perform better, maybe you can say, well done, feel free to proceed, or you can even more longer and personalized feedback. So this might be an alternative to this concern. I just wanted to um, share it with you during this presentation. So another area of Digicomp Edu is empowering learners. So I see also in the comments that people have been talking about whether there's a digital gap, whether it is about teacher's mentality or their abilities to use um, digital technologies or their access to actually digital resources. But to be honest, this is my personal view. And also this is what I actually have seen in my uh, thesis is that, but also I want to say that I have been working with uh, village teachers who have been teaching uh, in the rural parts of Turkey. I teach them English. And also within uh, the scope of another project, I have been working with students from a different um, socioeconomic backgrounds all around Turkey. So what I also observed in both of these projects is that unfortunately in Turkey, there is still a digital gap in terms of accessibility to digital uh, devices, internet and digital resources, especially in the rural areas of Turkey, like some villages and Eastern part of Turkey, especially also. Okay, uh, so what this knowledge means maybe for um, teachers. So if you know that there is some sort of a gap, digital gap, this might be about the abilities of using digital technologies or access. So what should teachers do at this point is that maybe you can find some alternatives or some um, um, assistive technologies for students with these challenges or maybe con contextual, physical or uh, other socioeconomic challenges uh, by using digital technologies or other technologies or non-digital base to support their progress uh, during the uh, learning environment, sorry, during the learning process so that they shouldn't be left behind. This is very important because while using digital technologies, you should also acknowledge that maybe not all of your students have equal access to digital resources. So one might ask, how can we know if our students have access to these devices or not? My comment would be having some sort of a needs analysis at the very beginning of the semester. Uh, I don't want to sign so scientific. What I mean by maybe this analysis can be a very uh, simple Google Forms that you can uh, send your students so that they can actually give you some information about their uh, digital uh, background, including the, the, uh, the, the tools they have access to. So this might be, or maybe their uh, learning disabilities or physical disabilities. So this might be a good uh, maybe way to overcome this problem to some extent. Also, differentiation and personalization is about addressing the um, needs, uh, different needs of uh, learners, such as dyslexia, ADHD, or maybe uh, learners with uh, or like uh, different interests, different abilities, overachievers, underachievers. So, using digital technologies to actually uh, address some of these uh, differences as much as you can. I mean. And finally, using digital technologies to foster learners' active and creative engagement with a subject matter. Again, uh, the framework focuses on the fact that uh, as teachers, we should actually give uh, our learners a chance to be uh, learn actively rather than passive, uh, passive um, listeners in the uh, traditional or um, conventional classrooms, I can say. So there are also some examples uh, of this area uh, related to this area. For example, for accessibility and inclusion, there are many text-to-speech tools. This, this can be, for example, natural reader can be used for um, students who have like dyslexia or maybe some um, visual disabilities that can um, 
uh, create problems for their uh, reading. Uh, but to be honest, I believe that I should also increase my uh, knowledge in this area because uh, there are different ways to increase accessibility and inclusion. Uh, mm, but I am also new to this area. I'm still exploring this. And this is the best tool that I can share with you at the moment. Um, OK, when it comes to differentiation and personalization, so this might uh, be tackled from a very broad perspective. But I wanted to simplify it by giving two well-known examples from the market, which is Kahoot and Quizzes. So, for example, teachers you can use these um, tools um, to offer a differentiated learning experience for learners. What I mean by this, for example, when you use Kahoot, uh, students see the questions uh, on the teacher's uh, screen or the projector or the smart board, and they cannot see the answers of the questions on their screen. So what they have to do is to switch the screens or split the screen. So they always need to have this teacher with them. So this is more, a bit more teacher-centered than quizzes. But what quizzes, um, that's different than Kahoot is that it uh, allows learners to see the questions uh, on their devices without necessarily needing a teacher. But more importantly, it allows learners to progress uh, at different rates. For example, while playing Kahoot, you expect all learners to answer the questions at the same time, because the faster you are, uh, more the, uh, the more successful you are. But what uh, happens with quizzes is that learners actually can answer questions at their own pace without feeling this uh, pressure because not all learners can learn at the same time. Uh, therefore, so one might ask then, what will happen if one student finishes earlier than the other students? This is a very good question, but maybe you can um, you can see the scores, by the way, the quizzes platform uh, shows you who finished early and who finished late. So based on this information, you can reach your students, maybe provide them a follow up task, or you might ask them to maybe um, look at their answers to identify their mistakes and try to find the correct answers, which may be a reflection type of activity. I hope this is clear. So this is the example, this is a simple example of how it can be tackled in a real classroom. So when it comes to actively engaging learners, it's about giving learners a chance to engage in um, authentic activities like book creation or may maybe some uh, recording a short uh, movie or short video uh, about a project that, uh, that they have been working on and also present this visually by also working with other teacher, sorry, other students uh, during this process. Another thing uh, which is important actually is uh, also relevant to other uh, subject areas as well. Uh, teachers can encourage their uh, learners to use uh, technology and internet to uh, conduct some research because it requires planning, performance, reflection, and they can also uh, present this their findings in a way that they feel the most um, useful way and they can actually receive feedback from their uh, learners as well. So I want to talk about the uh, complementary areas of this uh, framework, which is a uh, professional engagement. So as you can understand by the name of this area, it's about how teachers can use um, digital technologies to enhance their uh, organizational and professional communication and collaboration uh, with their colleagues, with the administrators, with students and uh, their parents. So what is crucial in this uh, area is that uh, teachers as lifelong learners should always um, question the existing um, ways of communicating or how things are tackled in their organization and can find a more innovative ways working with their um, colleagues and administrators and see this, uh, see the use of technology is actually change a chance to um, expand their professional um, development. So some examples can be webinars or conferences that are um, 
uh, available online, such as these ones. And also uh, the use of MOOCs or some um, non-profit or also profit uh, organize organizations like Khan Academy, Coursera, or edX maybe can be other also examples uh, of for teachers to use to increase their um, professional digital competence during this era. And finally, the area of uh, facilitating learners' digital competence. Now, the focus is not entirely on teachers' digital competence. It is more related to what teachers you, uh, what do with these digital competence to facilitate their own learners' digital competence. So this means that it is not enough for you to be a digitally competent practitioners. You need to also help your learners improve their digital competence so that they can be also responsible and uh, conscious users of technology, which is also emphasized in the DigCom framework. So the, as you can see here, there are uh, the, the sub areas, information and literacy, communication, content creation, responsible use and problem solving. So what is expected of you from uh, this area is to uh, design some learning activities that you, uh, learners can uh, actively um, solve some problems, they can create some content using these tools and learn actually how to attribute uh, some digital resources while using it responsibly. Co uh, Creative Commons license maybe can be also introduced uh, in the uh, classroom. So I will end my presentation. I am sorry if I if I took so much time, but this is important. I will finalize it in a, in five minutes. So one might ask. So there are twenty two uh, sub competencies. So how can we evaluate ourselves? So. As I mentioned before, there's a online check-in tool that can be used, but also you can have these, um, the, you can use the uh, report of the uh, framework to understand actually at which level you are for each competence area and some competence area. So throughout this report, there are some uh, competence statements I want to show you. For example, this is for creating digital resources. For example, a, a teacher at the A1 level can say, I, make, I may make use of digital resources, but I do not usually modify them or create my own resources. But a, a teacher at the C2 level uh, can, for example, say, I create my own apps or games to support my educational objectives. Can you see the huge difference? There's a huge cognitive gap from A1 to C2. Now, it is not enough for you to uh, actually expand your digital repertoire. You are already proficient in using many digital tools. You have some sort of understanding of how to use technology effectively based on your pedagogical approach. But now at this stage, you are actually a pioneer. You pass your knowledge on the novice teachers who are at the lower levels and you actually critique the existing uh, practices and you create innovative ones, both in terms of technical approaches and pedagogical approaches. As you can expect, uh, Redeker 2017 uh, states that there are only a few educators who are at this uh, C1 and C2 level, but I should also mention that it is not actually expected all teachers to reach these high levels. So in the report, it is said that actually experts and integrators are the backbones of the uh, education system. So maybe um, the short term goal for these teachers uh, would be to reach at least these two levels that can be considered as uh, intermediate by the uh, CFR level. Yes. Uh, this is also the cumulative fashion that is also highlighted in the, uh, in the CFR level and teachers actually uh, need uh, are expected to have the um, competences that are highlighted in the lower areas as they move, for, move forward uh, the higher stages. As you can see here, in order not to scare uh, educators too much, they actually labeled these areas with uh, such positive statements like awareness, exploration, integra integration, expertise, 
leadership and innovation. So the idea behind this is to actually celebrate our little achievements and find out what we can do next to expand our digital competence. Also, finally, I want to say that the, you will actually see this at this conference after you do this online uh, Digcom Edu survey. So after you take the survey, uh, for each uh, question, you receive a uh, detailed feedback from the system actually. For example, imagine that your answer is, I create my own digital resources and modify existing ones to adapt them to my needs. So I don't want to read this whole uh, lengthy uh, feedback, but it also tells you the next step you can take to uh, be more competent in this area. For example, in this case, it is explore more interactive formats. So it's also helping you in that way. So thank you very much for your attention. I try not. I tried not to. Um, and to talk too much because there's a time limitation. I hope you find it uh, useful. And if there's any questions, and if we have time, I will do my best to answer those questions. Thank you very much, Kazam, for this interesting presentation. You touched upon both practical and theoretical aspects, and you, I, I think you melted them in the same pot in a really successful way. So thank you. And there are lots of thanks in the chat as well. Uh, I'd like to read one comment, and there is one question then I will uh, address to you. Uh, one comment I would like to add by Asma. Al Sahil uh, is that there are a lot of digital tools that could be a great help for teachers, but the point is that teachers need to choose the tool carefully that really support achieving the pedagogical goals of the course. And in a related way, Michael Hibler says, like here could be the pedagogy wheel. I mean, one help could be the pedagogy wheel. So if you would like to comment on this comment, we would like to hear. Actually, I did my best to uh, actually support this view. I am also in line with this view. I mean, uh, I try to explain that it is not enough for te teachers to use uh, digital technologies in their lessons without critically considering if it is uh, needed in uh, uh, according to their teaching context, learning objective and pedagogical approach. Otherwise, there are maybe millions of tools. I am not exaggerating. There are many tools, but we should uh, have the knowledge, the content knowledge, technological knowledge and pedagogical knowledge together to assess these tools carefully to understand the affordances uh, for our lesson and um, make our decisions based on this uh, critical evaluation as uh, suggested by our participants. This is highly valuable. Thank you, Gizem. And there is also one question regarding your MA thesis. Uh, can you briefly, really briefly, we have uh, run out, running out of the time. So can you really briefly summarize what you have found in your MA thesis? Oh, actually, this is a very difficult question. I know this is a really big question, but maybe yeah. if you would like to because make some I further comments. I had six uh, research questions and I uh, do a collected data over seven months. And it was a qualitative case study, including research papers, uh, a survey, uh, interview, and lesson plans. But I, maybe I can touch upon the most important findings of my study very briefly. So what I found in my actually master thesis is that, for example, students perceived digital competence that is received through the survey didn't necessarily match their actual productions in lesson plans. So actually, uh, participants tended to over rate their uh, digital competences and when I analyzed their lesson plans I actually have seen that uh, they didn't actually show much improvement some of them at least uh, in uh, in the most uh, important areas of Digcom Edu because uh, we gave them uh, lesson plans at the beginning and at the end of the semester to see if there's any improvement but we unfortunately didn't see this uh, in some uh, part and when we analyze the cause of this, we uh, actually reflection papers actually show that these participants lack the necessary actually uh, pedagogical knowledge, despite being se senior level students, because they failed to take uh, actually uh, this uh, skills based teaching course 
prior to this course. So it, it has uh, ha had a big impact on the study. And also uh, my study uh, confirms the finding that in the absence of real teaching, since uh, participants do not have real access to teaching environments, except their um, macro teaching in the second semester, it wouldn't be realistic to expect pre-service AFL teachers to develop a significant development in all areas of teach comp edu. So although lesson plans are uh, significant in terms of um, uh, supporting learners, uh, pre-service AFL teachers, I mean, uh, digital competence development, it wouldn't be actually uh, enough. Uh, and finally, uh, teachers, uh, pre-service teachers, uh, digital competence development is a complex factor that is um, affected by many factors, including their um, macro teaching uh, experience. So it is really difficult to pinpoint one uh, specific uh, finding, uh, sorry, cause for this maybe lack of transfer from uh, the coursework to um, lesson plans and then also the, their macro teaching practice. Uh, I hope this is uh, useful because, as I said, it is a 300 something page uh, thesis, so it was difficult for me to summarize it. Sure, Gizem. I mean, the best way you can do. Thank you very much. Thank and you. both you and Senem Hoca shared with us amazing tools. I, I mean, I wrote them down. I, I guess all most of our attendees also did the same. So thank you very much.